It seems I can't take a Christmas break. Once away from the computer for a couple of weeks, everything seems to have gone mad. And the question on many people's lips at present, it seems, as the new consoles dawn onto the horizon, is not the opportunities they offer in games, or the increase in world density, the frame rates, or sheer visual fidelity. No, the real question is much bigger, more profound, and defining than that. Is 9 a big enough number? And is it worse than a bigger one? Now I may be able to answer that right here, but strap in, as this could get scary and terror floppy. Uh. Now to kick off, let's discuss my video from a couple of weeks back, after Microsoft's surprise reveal of the new next-gen Xbox. Much was discussed, demonstrated, and actual casing was demonstrated, which was clear the target is to go high power, high clocks, with a drive on thermal cooling and quiet acoustics. Now this means two things for a chip design. You either go wide, more cores, or wider bus, or you go fast, less cores, more clock speed, or actions per cycle. Think of it as the bus versus the ZX10. You can take magnitudes more people, bits per journey, back and forth on the bus, but your journey will be much, much slower than the bike. But the bike is limited to two bits at a time, but magnitudes faster. Now which is the better option? As with most things, it's a little bit of both is the ideal, and as the old saying goes, what is the best way to eat an elephant? Bit by bit. Now, if 12 teraflops is the target, I hypothesized a possible configuration of that from the GPU portion of the chip. 60 cores with 64 shaders per core at around 1575 MHz is the wide option to get to that target. The norm for a smaller fixed spec console. The clocks are lower, but you are powering more transistors to get there. But this keeps noise, heat and power lower and more controllable, but takes up more die space, cost, and is only one option. The other is to cut the cores down both in space on chip and via the ever-present redundancy at the production process, as you can bin more of your chips off to target if you require less active cores on the chip. Now this option thus needs faster clocks to achieve the same theoretical throughput, keep that in mind, and therefore will require more power and thus heat. Now realistically I think the other end of the scale here is to go to 48 cores, it's around 80% smaller than the 60 core version, at around 1950 MHz, which is very very high for a GPU anyway, let alone an APU with a closed console box, but both of these configurations deliver 11.98 teraflops, let's say 12 for the sake of argument. Now the first option requires a higher yield. Now this is the amount of chips to deliver the required spec of cores that are active and work at the level intended. Now this is what I talked about a few years ago when I stated the consoles would launch in 2020 due to manufacturers process for 7 nanometer that will be more refined and possibly even improved such as nanometer plus 7 nanometer plus and thus yields improve getting them closer to the target and reducing cost less waste. Now the risk here is on an unknown future level and this process can also dictate the option a company takes i.e. If yields are lower than expected, then option 2 becomes the only option you have. Now what is option 2? Well as I say, it's to cut a smaller chip from the same wafer, maximising your units, getting less active cores than needed, but to be clocked higher to make up the deficit, and this of course can be by design or as above, by default or necessity. Now, reality usually falls somewhere in between this, having some operating margins to work to and testing realistic clock speeds and performance. This is where your leaked results come from on 3 d Mark, etc. As all these prototypes are built, tested and logged to validate the options before you tape out, i.e. complete your design. Now, once these are all done and retail spec units start arriving, building them into the case, testing thermals, burn-in tests, etc., smoke testing, everything else that goes along with hardware design, it may yet yield a little more on clock speeds or even the reverse. Now, this is the design margins I spoke about earlier, and this is all within expectations. No company here is new at this. Now in addition, and very pertinent to these chip tests, is the dev kits have to be shipped to developers before the hardware actually exists. 
and as such these are pulled together using as close as possible hardware reflections. The early PS3 kits for example used an Nvidia 7800 or G70 chip target for the RSX GPU. The Xbox 360 used a Power Mac based machine. Hell, even the original Xbox development kits were just PCs running the operating system. The point is that to get teams working to some target levels as soon as possible, they need to give them a base. Now likely, that is a Zen CPU and a 5700 GPU clocked as high as it can go, as it delivers the same RDNA architecture and API they need to work with, albeit at an older generation card and missing new features such as ray tracing hardware supported DRS for example. Now look back most early dev kits and they were a mashup under spec from the final dev kits which tend to have slightly more resources in memory hard drives and possibly even gpu at this point i think final silicon will be out or just about coming out as we're around 10 months from release they may not be taped out as yet but it's going to be any time now probably in january early next year now as such anything devs have will not be final as yet and it almost certainly is changing every month or so. Now I believe this is why we have seen so many chips tested as combinations of AMT testing, development kits, Sony, Microsoft's own teams, and everyone works towards the same target. They need to build APIs, compilers, SDKs, new tools and tests, and you can't do this by theoretics alone. So a lot of what they're building will be around those specific specifications. Now one of the biggest leaks that's gained traction which I've seen is this 36 core 2 gigahertz GPU. That's not going to be the final retail kit, not in a million years. It's most likely what they're doing, as I say, to clock a 5700 to get closest to the can for the teams to develop against. It's going to be under spec. It will not be clocked that high. You don't have an APU, let's say it's an APU, with a 3.5 gigahertz 8 core 16 thread CPU paired with a 2 gigahertz 36 core GPU inside a closed box running at those kind of speeds that's faster than a 5700 XT. It's just not theoretically possible unless the box is going to be very expensive in terms of power management, gating and heat. I don't see that. It's just too dangerous for a consumer product. What will be is a combination of the two. So I still think that 10 teraflops is their target there or thereabouts. I don't think that's changed from what I said over two years ago. Now, taking all that aside, because it's largely irrelevant, it doesn't mean anything looking at these specs. It's not telling us anything we don't already know. It's just testing the waters and trying to give devs and teams an idea of just the kind of power performance and throughput they're working towards. It's never going to be final. There is always going to be tweaking in the last seven, eight months of development as things get nearer and nearer at launch. This is why launch titles always suffer more because they're building games based on specs they don't even know yet and are generally moving in transit as they do it's a moving feast now the final piece of the jigsaw and most important is the case design and cost targets a console is far more than just a chip you have hard drives nvme ssds in this case blu-ray optical drives psu controllers flash ram fans and a pcb to house all this and it's the most volatile area of them all the gddr6 memory as this is getting expensive due to demand and likely to increase in 2020, this is one of the reasons why I think 16 gigabytes is the realistic target we can expect. It may also be the reason for the SSD. It's being referred to as much as it is as a virtual cache. Now you can supplement this as an addressable space at a hardware level within the TLB, but this would not replace actual VRAM as it's far, far, far too slow for that. Don't get confused as that being an option. But it could help with streaming of data as needed, which will enable worlds to be more cohesive and seamless. But it could also help with the memory allocation to the operating system by using that TLB and that virtual cache, a little bit like they did with the Pro. If you look at the Pro hardware design for Sony, that kind of gave you an idea of what they were moving towards. They put in much cheaper DDR3, one gigabyte of RAM to allocate to the operating system for storing games basically hibernating your system and very quickly resuming back to an active system and therefore that's why you saw 512 megabytes pass back to the games on the pro which is a minimal uplift but all this is not a discussion for now so sorry i even brought it up the main point is the cost of all these parts from the bomb the bill of materials that make up the entire manufacturing cost many of these choices are planning ahead 
in the next 12 to 24 months of sales when sales really pick up the bomb will have reduced significantly and thus each unit turns a profit now and now a loss leader is the most common target for consoles and in fact many areas of consumer products use this practice when you sell one or two million consoles in 12 months the whales, that's us hardcore, are also consumers of more products that go alongside this. Second controllers, high price for a profit, PS Plus, Game Pass, Xbox Live subscription and games. Lots and lots of games, preferably digital, as this makes the most amount of profit for all concerned as it cuts out the middleman, retail manufacturer, and yet charges us even more for less. The perfect example of why software attracts investors right once sell forever now what does all this mean then well it means that for around four or five hundred pounds these consoles will drop into the market at the high end of gaming performance how high all depends on the target each company has and this is why two SKUs make sense which both tested within this generation in the here and now though i think the target sweet spot is somewhere between the two prices and only the relevant company knows their targets but let's take the statement that the PS5 and possibly the next box is circa 9 teraflops. Like I say, I still think we're looking around 10.5 to 12 teraflops as a target. I'm not going to say they're going to achieve it. But with hardware-based ray tracing acceleration, far more efficient RDNA 2 architecture, smaller nodes, a CPU that is over four times the performance level of the current Jaguar cores with twice the hardware threads, faster speeds, the leap here is very, very big and is generationally up with the previous leaps we have seen. In CPU alone, it's much bigger than what we saw from the PS360 era. Now combine all this with the techniques, improved engines and talent that is rife across the industry right now. This means the shift to new hardware will not require such a long and adaptive change that we saw at the start of this one. Although change is constant, so it will still change and improve as the generation continues. But engines such as Decima are already geared up for persistent streaming of data, high poly through count, vast landscapes, PBR based materials. Capcom will also start on the front foot with its RE engine that is already set to deliver the goods from the off. Maybe deep down will rise back up again. Now Unreal Engine 4 has grown over its lifespan and with games such as Days Gone demonstrating that it can handle open world design. Now in addition and more importantly is the tools, the APIs and the SDKs the machines ship with and teams need and use to make the baseline and develop across the systems. Now for me, ray tracing will really help developers and artists more and it will reduce memory usage as the option to handle light and asset change at runtime reduces the development process, speeds up iterations and art design and reduces the amount of textures, assets and buffers you need to hold in RAM. The shift to photogrammetry that RE and other teams have moved to is another as this reduces the authoring time, improves the quality of materials and thus reduces development time and cost. Now, if at this point you are still unconvinced that if 9 teraflops is that target, take into account that with a machine that is only one-fifth of that proposed hardware, maybe less if you take all things into consideration, we have already enjoyed games that look like this. that can run like this and take us into VR realms impossible only one generation earlier and only an option on medium level PCs right now. Now for IQ infused viewers this means that you will have more than enough horsepower to deliver true 4K games with other visual enhancements such as better lighting, improved shadows or reflections and if you think that 1440p is the perfect level of resolution target, and I do sit around that level on the fence I might say, then you, by halving the pixel throughput, then faster frame rates or improved graphical features or both, your rewards and choice is never a bad thing. Horizon 2, a new Spider-Man, Hellblade 2, as we've already seen, and the next Batman game, and many, many more we have not yet, are all behind closed doors to entice us, loosen our wallets, and return us to those exciting moments that only a new generation of consoles can bring. 
So bringing this video to a close, I hope it helped explain a lot to what's going on behind the scenes and why you've got to take all this information with more than a pinch of salt. It's just information. But the big question I started the video was, is nine a big enough number? And my answer is the same as it's always been. It's the wrong question. Teams, hardware, tools, talent and imagination are the most important part of game development. And looking around at the sources we have, I think the magic is coming and you cannot put a number on that. Well, aside 2020, of course. Anyway, I hope you guys and girls enjoyed this. Remember, I am completely self-funded and independent. This is a part-time gig for me. I don't do this as a full-time thing. I work in this industry day in, day out for the past 20 or so years. So even though I don't make console hardware, so a lot of what I'm talking about is a known entity to me. Doesn't mean I know what's going on in the systems in terms of Microsoft and Sony. Do not take that as a given. But let's be honest, pretty much everyone else talking about us on the internet doesn't either. Anyway, there's more to come. It'll only be a few months before we see the reveals from the consoles, so we can talk more when we know more. I'll see you on the next one. PS4 Pro, November the 10th, 2016, priced at $399. Thank you, everyone, for your time and for joining us today. Thanks very much.